Hello, um, in the unit atomic structure, uh, in today's class we will discuss Rutherford's atom model. Let us start with the discovery of electron by J.J. Thomson in 1897. Uh, in the figure, um, we can see the cathode ray tube used by Thomson for the measurement of charge by mass ratio or E by M ratio of electron beam. Um, See, uh, this type of um, glass tubes were used in physics starting from 1850s. Henrik Geisler was the first person who designed them. Um, electrodes are fitted at uh, both ends, um, are sealed into the, uh, into the glass tubes at uh, two ends so that uh, we can apply voltage in the tube. And uh, the, the, usually the glass tube will be connected to a, a gas pump to remove uh, gas from this um, Tube, so that the pressure inside the tube can be reduced uh, very much. Okay, in Geisler tubes, the typical pressure was uh, nearly one by thousand times uh, uh, one by thousandth of one atmospheric pressure. Now that was in 1850s, and then in 1870s, William Crookes, an English uh, physicist, he modified Geisler tubes. Uh, the main modification was that the pressure inside the, the Crookes tube, okay, could be um, made very low um, um, let us say one millionth um, of a, of one atmosphere okay one one millionth of one atmosphere uh, that much pressure uh, can be um, very very low pressure could be achieved um, by in, in the Crookes tube and uh, this is actually a Crookes tube and uh, Thomson redesigned this Crookes tube uh, to suit his purpose and uh, here these two in this side and this side you, the two metal electrodes are sealed inside the tube and they can be connected to external wires um, okay so this uh, usually negative voltage is supplied here so this is a cathode and positive voltage is supplied here and, and a wire from here will be connected to these two anodes okay so this, this will be anodes and we can see if you look carefully you can see horizontal slits here okay so when from cathode uh, electron beam will be accelerated towards anode and it will pass through these small horizontal slits so we get um, anodes are also act, anode is also act, acting as uh, collimators so a narrow beam of electron will reach here and here uh, you can see uh, two horizontal metal plates okay one side you can see here and the other side you can see here horizontal metal plates okay uh, they are used to apply an electric field along this vertical direction. Okay, let us say this is the x direction. So electron beam is passing along the x axis and an electric field is applied along the y axis. And uh, these two are uh, poles of an electromagnet. When electric, field, electric current is passed through this magnet, um, a magnetic field will be produced along z direction. Okay, so essentially electron beam is passing through crossed electric and magnetic field. Crossed means mutually perpendicular electric and magnetic field. Here electric field is acting along the y direction and magnetic field will be acting along the z direction. So by switching on the different fields, either electric field or magnetic field or both, we can uh, deflect, uh, Thomson was able to deflect the electron beam to different uh, extents. And uh, on the other end of the tube, you can see a, a semicircular plate which is acting as a screen when electron beam is incident on the screen there will be a coating on the screen a scintillation will be produced here a bright spot okay so as the spot moves we can see observe the deflection of the electron beam so this was the the instrument used by thomson this was patented by thomson and uh, uh, after thomson's discovery in the next 20-25 uh, years this particular instrument was used for the charge by measurement of the charge by mass ratio of many particles and also Crookes tube was uh, later redesigned in uh, around 1910 uh, as um, this triode valves used in electronic circuits before transistors and uh, another development was cathode ray tubes uh, used in early television monitors television screens uh, this Crookes tube or we can say cathode ray tube was responsible for uh, two important discoveries in physics in 1895 uh, 
um, X-rays were discovered using this type of um, glass tubes. Essentially, X-ray tube is a, a redesigning of this cathode ray tube. And in 1897, in the measurement of charge by mass ratio of electron. Okay, so that is the, the, the history um, of this cathode ray tube. And now we can go to the actual measurement of uh, Thomson's experiment for the measurement of charge by mass ratio. Now, this is the same figure of the cathode ray tube that we have seen in the previous slide. On, only difference is that uh, now uh, the cathode is on the left side and the, the screen is on the right side and the electron beam is moving from left to right okay now the the main figure of this tube is the same one in thomson's uh, paper in april 1897 announcing the the measurement of charge by mass ratio of electron so we are using thomson's same figure uh, i have added some extra lines uh, showing the direction of motion of this uh, uh, the path of the electron beam Okay, so look at this figure. Um, this cathode is having negative polarity and uh, you can see um, positive polarity applied to the, uh, to the anode here and uh, these two have a horizontal slit so they act as collimators also. So electron beam from the cathode is accelerated to the anode so we get a narrow beam here. Now once the electron beam comes out of this uh, anode, okay, um, this uh, red dashed line represents the, the path of the undeflected electron beam. It goes straight and strikes the screen at the point O. Now once the electron beam comes out of the, the, the collimators, uh, it's, uh, there is no longer any force along the x-axis. Uh, see, look at this uh, coordinates. Uh, horizontal direction is x-axis, uh, vertical direction is y-axis and uh, towards U is the z-axis. Okay. So, electron beam passes horizontally and there is no force in this uh, setup, there is no force, no longer any force. After, there is a horizontal force uh, between cathode and anode accelerating the electron beam. But uh, once it comes out of the two collimators, okay, second collimator, um, or once it comes out of the anode, we can say, uh, there is no longer any force along the x-axis. Uh, so, the x component of velocity of the electron remains constant throughout. Okay. Now here, um, there are the horizontal metal plates that you remember from the previous uh, figure. Let us say the, uh, the, the positive polarity is applied to the top plate and negative polarity to the bottom plate. Then electron beam will be deflected upward and uh, strikes the screen at the point M if you apply only the electric field. Why? Because electrons are negatively charged particle and it will be deflected towards the positive plate. Actually, when a charged particle is moving perpendicular to a uniform electric field, we have applied a uniform electric field here, it moves in a parabolic path. We can show that this path of the electron beam deflecting upward is parabolic within the electric field. Once it comes out of the electric field, it goes straight tangentially and strikes the screen at the point M. Now, suppose instead of the electric field, we apply only magnetic field. The, where is uh, the region of the magnetic field? I have not, uh, the, the magnetic poles are not shown in this figure. This uh, green dark uh, dashed line represents the area of the magnetic field. Uh, from the previous uh, photo of the cathode ray tube, you can imagine uh, one pole um, I mean, in front of the tube and the other one behind. So this uh, direction of the magnetic field is along the Z direction. Uh, it is perpendicular and inward. Uh, look at this. Um, symbol standard symbol that we use perpendicular and uh, inward so um, so if you apply only magnetic field to, to this undeflected beam there is magnetic Lorentz force q into v cross b uh, so what is the direction of this force um, horizontal v is along the x direction right uh, because the electron beam is traveling along the x direction and b is per so it is plus x direction b is perpendicular and inward that is minus z direction then v cross b is along plus y direction this you have to verify okay v cross v cross b will be along the plus y direction but uh, direction of magnetic lorentz force is q into v cross b here q is actually minus e electrons charge is negative so uh, the direction of deflection of the beam will be opposite to v cross b which is minus y direction so the beam will be deflected downward 
and it uh, strikes the screen at the point let us say n so the most original aspect of thomson's experiment was a clever way to to measure the horizontal component of uh, the x component of velocity of the electron beam and what he did was um, we will see why he required a x component of velocity but let us see how he measured it what he did was now we see that when you apply only electric field the beam will be deflected upward okay when you apply only magnetic field the beam will be deflected downward when there is no electric no field no electric field no magnetic field the beam will go straight and strikes the point o so what thomson did was he applied both electric field and magnetic field okay these mutually per, you can see that the electric field is along the y direction magnetic field is uh, electric field is actually along the minus y direction and magnetic field is along the minus z direction they they are mutually perpendicular such uh, electric and magnetic fields are called crossed electric and magnetic fields so thomson applied crossed electric and magnetic fields okay and uh, so the electric force is along plus y direction magnetic lorentz force is along minus y direction they are they are mutually they are in opposite directions and he tuned the value of the electric field capital e and the magnetic field capital b until again he got an undeflected beam at the point o okay that is even in the presence of crossed electric and magnetic field he got an undeflected beam what is the condition for that the electric force along the minus y direction should be balanced by the magnetic lorentz force along the uh, electric force along the plus y direction should be balanced by the magnetic force along the minus y direction right so we have to if you equate the mag uh, the, the magnitude of the forces let us see what happens okay i will write here uh, I will write on the right side uh, here. So uh, we can write electric force that is QE is equal to magnetic Lorentz force, okay, which is Q Vx P. Vx is the horizontal velocity which is perpendicular to the magnetic field, okay. Vx is the x component of velocity which is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So this component should appear in this expression. So electric force is equal to magnetic Lorentz force. This Q is actually minus E, charge of the electron. Um, so Q, charge of the electron will cancel on both sides. What you get is X component of velocity is equal to E by B. Okay. So this was a very clever way a very brilliant idea to measure uh, the x component of velocity of the electron so actually the ratio we, we what we get x component of velocity as the ratio of electric field and magnetic field when we get an undeflected beam in the presence of simultaneous electric and magnetic field crossed electric and magnetic fields actually this uh, way of measuring the, the the velocity is a particular technique uh, which is called velocity selector Okay. Thomson was the first person who employed this technique, this velocity selector technique. That means uh, when you when you apply uh, cross electric and magnetic fields and tune the electric fields and magnetic electric field and magnetic field to get an undeflected beam, always the the x component of velocity, horizontal component will be like this ratio of electric field and magnetic field. So um, wh what is what you are doing is uh, from a beam of particles, you are picking up. Uh, those particles having a particular velocity or a, a narrow a, a narrow band of velocities around a particular value okay so this is called this technique is called velocity selector and uh, after thomson successful measurement of charge by mass ratio of electron this velocity selector technique has been used widely um, to uh, in, in the in the mass spectrograph mass spectrogram um, of uh, different charged particles okay that is another story um, <clears throat> now let us see how he um, used this x component of velocity to calculate the charge by mass ratio of electron so i have drawn um, look at the the left side uh, i have drawn this uh, metal plates here 
okay positive plate and negative plate the separation between the plates is d and the length of this metal plates is l so we initially we get an undeflected beam at o when you switch on the electric field the the the, the electric, electric electron beam will travel along a parabolic path uh, when it leaves the electric field it will it will travel in a straight line tangentially tangential to the parabolic path and uh, strikes the screen at the point m now um, the maximum deflection along the y axis along the y direction will happen when the just at the moment um, the electron leaves the electric field okay so let us call it theta now from this uh, triangle um, so i will write here below this uh, figure on the left side from this triangle you can okay let me continue um, so uh, from the figure on the left side we can write tan theta equals vy by vx where vy is the y component of velocity of the electron beam and vx is the x component of velocity now this tan theta is very small because uh, electron is deflected through an angle theta only for a small distance l the, the length of the metal plate is very small compared to the actual distance the electron beam is traveling so theta is very small only a very small deflection happens along the y direction so tan theta when theta is very small tan theta is approximately theta so we can write theta equals vy by vx okay um see uh, the x component of velocity already we have obtained as e by b now let us see what is the y component of velocity how does the electron get y component of velocity uh, look at the undeflected beam there is only x component of velocity but when uh, we know that magnetic field does not do any work so it does not change the um, the velocity of the electron but who changes the velocity of the electron along the y direction is the electric field when the electron reaches the metal plate what happens is there is a uniform electric field along the y direction so uh, along the actually electric field is along the minus y direction so there is a an electric force along the plus y direction since the electric field is constant this force is also constant e into small e into capital e where small e is the charge of the q into e okay where q is the charge of the electron so this is acting along plus y direction that is why electron beam is deflected upward in the electric field uh, so this uniform force along the y direction produces a uniform acceleration okay so which is the reason for getting a velocity along the y direction so the y component of velocity let us write here vy i can write as if the acceleration is uniform velocity change in change in velocity is simply acceleration into time uh, so ay y component of acceleration into t i am using capital t it is a total time taken by the electron beam to as it passes through the electric field to cross the electric field okay and what is this ay force by mass force is e into capital e here we need to take only the magnitude of the force okay the direction of force is along uh, plus y direction right that is because electric field is along minus y direction charge of the electron is minus e okay so q into e will be along the minus e into electric field along uh, minus y direction so the force will be along the plus y direction so the the signs have been taken care of by uh, uh, considering that the force is along the plus y direction magnitude of the force we can substitute here small e into capital e divided by mass of the electron so force by mass that is the y component of the acceleration now what is the time taken uh, for the electron um, beam to cross the uh, electric field okay look at the figure on the left hand side the the length of the metal plates is l okay and the time taken uh, to cross the that length l is simply distance by velocity okay uh, distance is l uh, the length of the metal plate and uh, the horizontal velocity is vx so we can write t is simply l by vx okay let us substitute this value so uh, in the expression theta so theta is equal to right e by m into e into l 
divided by there is a vx uh, in the expression for vy and there is another vx in the denominator in the expression for theta so we have two vx we have vx square okay so i can rearrange this e by m is equal to theta vx square divided by e into i here theta we can measure uh, how much is the maximum deflection along the angular deflection along the y axis theta that we can measure from the geometry of this uh, uh, apparatus you can work it out how to measure theta and the capital e is the applied electric field which we are applying right so we know the value l is the length of the metal pipe which we know so the unknown quantity is vx horizontal component of the um, electron beams velocity and uh, that is we have calculated on the right side uh, using the thomson's unique velocity selector technique vx is e by v let us substitute the value here for vx so vx square is e square by b square so one uh, the value of one electric field will cancel from the numerator and denominator so what you get is uh, okay theta theta into e okay e square one e square will cancel divided by l b square correct e square by b square one e will cancel now um, you can further write this as uh, theta into instead of electric field i can say if the potential difference applied between the plates is capital v and uh, the separation between the plates is d electric field is simply potential difference divided by the distance so this is some theta into v divided by b square l d that is the expression look at this expression theta we can measure from the geometry and capital v is the applied voltage that we know capital b is the applied magnetic field that we know l is the length of the metal plate we should know that d is the separation between the metal plate so all these are related to the geometry so <clears throat> from these um, values thomson was able to measure the charge by mass ratio of the electron beam at that time in 1897 the value thomson obtained was approximately 1 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram okay 1 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram see uh, this value uh, <coughs> this value uh, is an approximate value uh, 1 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram so in this particular experiment thomson was able to obtain only the charge by mass ratio of the electron and not electric charge and uh, mass separately but uh, uh, he was he had also done similar charge by mass ratio measurement on ionized hydrogen atoms okay hydrogen atoms uh, in which one electron uh, the electron was knocked off so uh, at that time uh, it was called simply um, charged hydrogen atom okay now we call it uh, hydrogen ion so in, in using beams of hydrogen ions he was he had measured charge by mass ratio and it was nearly 10 raised to 8 coulombs per kilogram okay the value obtained here is 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram this is charged by mass okay so there are two possibilities um, there are three possibilities mainly um, well, either the mass of the this particle cathode ray particles okay uh, these particles must be uh, some 1 by 1000 times less than okay mass of hydrogen atom because uh, mass becomes 1 by 10,000 times less then charge by mass ratio becomes 10,000 uh, 10, I mean 1 by 1000 times okay so uh, 1 by 1000 times less then the when then the charge by mass ratio becomes 10,000 times higher instead of 10 raised to 8 becomes 10 raised to 11 so either mass of these particles are 1 by 1000 times that of uh, hydrogen atom or charge must be very large okay th then also charge by mass ratio can increase charge must be uh, 1000 times greater or there is a combination of these two okay so th there is a possibility that uh, um, these particles could be having mass uh, very less compared to even that of hydrogen atom okay then uh, what uh, thomson did further experiments he 
did this same charge by mass ratio measurements uh, using different cathode materials okay uh, then he showed that uh, he get the same charge he got the same charge by mass ratio even if cathode materials were different so this charge by mass ratio is independent was independent uh, shown to be independent of um, cathode ray materials ca sorry cathode materials and uh, he used different gases inside this uh, discharge tube um, then also he got the same value so it was independent of the nature of the gas and uh, also um, these particles were found to be the same as those emitted uh, during photoelectric effect uh, measurements so from these uh, repeated measurements uh, experiments thomson concluded that these particles must be a universal constituent of matter in his 1897 paper and in his talks at that time he raised this possibility that there must be some very small constituents very small fundamental constituents of matter of atoms uh, but the conclusive evidence came uh, some two years later in 1899 see uh, one of Thomson's students uh, was uh, CTR Wilson he had uh, uh, discovered that um, ions act as uh, condensation centers for water drops when uh, damp air was cooled by sudden expansion okay this type of uh, air is called um, or vapor is called super saturated vapor okay when uh, so super saturated vapor or damp vapor was suddenly uh, expanded then it cools and condensation can happen so if ions pass through this uh, air ions will act as condensation centers actually tom wilson developed this idea later um, to 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 design the first cloud chamber okay wilson was the person who invented cloud chamber okay so uh, what uh, thompson and his students did in 1899 was they um, made measurements on charged clouds okay and to estimate the electric charge um, the, the charge of the electron and uh, they found that the electrons charge uh, can be between uh, 1.1 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb to 2.3 times 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb they, they, they were able to set a range for the possible electric charge of the, these particles 1.1 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb to 2.3 into as high, high as 2.3 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb it was um, that their estimate in 1899 but there were uh, this measurement technique was inaccurate because um, thompson in, uh, had to introduce some approximations in the in the calculations so which made this uh, technique inaccurate but this technique uh, was very important in three senses um, one is that it gave us uh, a, a, a range of possible values for the electric charge it's of the order of 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb that was important and secondly it was the first uh, use of cloud chamber technique in physics okay and thirdly this type of thomson's attempt to take a measurement of the measurement on uh, charged clouds this uh, attempt earlier attempt gave robert millikan the idea of taking more accurate measurements on charged drops instead of using charged clouds millikan used charged drops that was millikan's oil drop experiment uh, in in 1909 to some 1900 13 in, in, a, in an extended set of measurements he accurately measured the charge of the electron and he was using charged drops but he got this idea from thompson's uh, earlier attempts okay so we can conclude um, by 1899 thompson was able to measure or estimate that charge of the electron must be of the order of 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb okay, he was able to show that charge by mass ratio is of the order of 10 raised to 11 coulomb per kilogram okay so if we take the ratio charge divided by charge by mass we get 10 raised to minus 30 kilogram so the the mass of the these particles okay must be of the order of 10 raised to minus 30 kilogram now the mass of the lightest atom it was known that the mass of the hydrogen atom uh, was known at that time okay so if you compare these to uh, the mass of one hydrogen atom is approximately we know 1.67 times 10 raised to minus 27 kilograms so if you compare these values um, uh, he thompson concluded in 1899 that uh, 
mass of these new particles that he he detected uh, they, their mass is nearly 1 by 2000 times mass of hydrogen atom lightest atom so this was the conclusive evidence to 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 predict to to declare that these particles these electrons are fundamental constituents of matter they must be present in all atoms okay the name electron was coined uh, a little earlier in 1891 by johnston stony an english physicist uh, johnston stony uh, he introduced this term electron to uh, to refer the fundamental measure of electric charge okay so uh, initially thomson was using another term he called them corpuscles these particles and then uh, very soon uh, the term electron was attributed to these particles so this was the way thomson measured the charge by mass ratio in 1897 measured the charge approximate charge in 1899 and concluded that the these particles these electrons must be um, uh, fundamental constituents of matter. In 1906, uh, Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to J.J. Thomson. Uh, he was usually referred by his colleagues and friends by J.J. So in 1906, Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to J.J. for his discovery of uh, electron. Okay. Um, these are the presently accepted values of um, electric charge mass and uh, charge by mass ratio of electron um, 1.602177 into 10 raised to minus 19 coulomb actual decimal points will go to a large number i have uh, rounded off to six decimal points okay and uh, mass is 9.109384 into 10 raised to minus 31 kilogram charge by mass ratio 1.758820 into 10 raised to 11 coulombs per kilogram and uh, the reference for these values are national institute of standards and technology nast usa uh, this uh, hyperlink you will give you the site okay you can look into that style site so uh, once it was understood that there must be particles um, for example electrons which are smaller than the smallest atom hydrogen atom then the question is uh, then then it was understood that atoms are not indestructible okay there are something smaller than atoms so atoms must be made up of smaller particles then the question was um, um, aroused uh, that is uh, what what can what is the structure of the atom okay Thomson was one of the first persons who proposed an atom model. So Thomson's atom model was proposed in 1898. Uh, it is something like this. He assumed that uh, the, the, the positive charge of the atom must be uniformly distributed over a sphere. Okay, a uniformly charged positive sphere. And uh, these new particles that he had discovered, uh, these electrons, electrons must be distributed randomly on this sphere. Uh, this is often referred to as a plum pudding model okay so uh, consider um, uh, this, uh, this positively charged nucleus as a plum pudding a plum cake and uh, just like uh, we uh, raisins on a cake on a plum pudding uh, electrons are distributed um, different 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 uh, points on this plum pudding this was uh, proposed in 1898 now, uh, six years later, in 1904, uh, Thomson and also independently, a Japanese physicist, uh, Nagaoka, they independently proposed uh, a planetary model of the atom also, uh, in, in which uh, this was, in Thomson's case, it was a modification of his plum pudding model. In this planetary model, Thomson and Nagaoka, independently, they argued that these electrons must be revolving around a common center. Okay, so Thomson, uh, these two persons had a planetary model of the atom also. But the idea basically is that the electric charge is uniformly distributed over a, uh, over the entire spherical atom. Okay, this was Thomson's atom model. Now let us move on to <coughs> the most important, uh, most important discovery in physics. Um, this uh, was possible because of a uh, 
an important experiment which is called alpha particle scattering experiment now this experiment was um, designed by ernest rutherford before we began uh, discussion on this experiment let us consider rutherford's background briefly uh, <clears throat> rutherford uh, ernest rutherford uh, he was thomson student in cavendish laboratory in university of cambridge uh, between 1895 and 1898 now from 1898 to uh, 1907 he worked in mcgill university in montreal canada there uh, he made a, uh, his initial major discoveries he made in mcgill university frederick sodi was his uh, research assistant there and uh, rutherford uh, discovered there that um, his major discoveries were um, he discovered the radioactive half life uh, he discovered the radioactive element radon and uh, he also differentiated and named this alpha radiations and beta radiations okay because of these uh, um, major contributions he got nobel prize in chemistry in 1908 okay uh, in 1907 rutherford came to manchester university in england and there um, in the figure uh, you can see hans geiger on the left side hans geiger was uh, rutherford's uh, research assistant in manchester university on the right side you can see ernest masden masden was his phd student okay um now here uh, from 1907 onwards rutherford was involved in a series of experiments which led to his greatest discovery okay in rutherford's case is exceptional in the sense that uh, his greatest discoveries came after he got a nobel prize in this case a nobel prize in chemistry between uh, 1907 and 1909 in the, in the two year period rutherford and geiger developed uh, two different techniques uh, for the detection of alpha particles uh, first one was um, Uh, counting scintillations on a zinc sulfide screen scintillation scintillation means bright spots so when alpha particles are incident on a zinc sulfide screen um, they get um, bright spots or scintillations and these scintillations can be counted that was one technique second one was uh, measuring the electrical discharge in an ionization chamber they designed an ionization chamber for that and uh, uh, when an electric discharge is produced it means that an alpha particle is Uh, passed through that chamber um, actually hans geiger developed this second method uh, to um, design geiger counter and later he further designed it uh, along with muller as geiger muller counter short form is gm counter okay so that uh, that measurement technique was originated in this uh, manchester university lab in this period <coughs> okay and in 1909 rutherford and another phd student thomas roids showed that uh, alpha particles are ionized helium atoms okay in helium atoms where the two electrons are removed uh, in in today's terms we say that alpha particles are helium nucleus but at that time the idea of nucleus was not there so ionized helium atoms so um, the point is that by 1909 rutherford and his team were very sure about the structure of alpha particles and uh, they developed two different techniques for measuring alpha particles now with this uh, um, background rutherford started using beam of high energy alpha particles um, to probe the structure of the atom during the period 1908 and 1909 geiger and masden okay measured uh, how alpha particles are scattered by metallic foils different metallic foils now here we can see an experimental um, arrangement of this their technique there is a radiation source the radiation source of alpha particles they used either radium uh, or radon hmm? then um, use when alpha particles are passed through a collimator they get a narrow beam of alpha particles here is a metal foil uh, either gold foil or any other metal foil then uh, the scattered when alpha particles are scattered they used a, a fluorescent screen a zinc sulfide screen 
okay the, the the first type of technique measurement technique is used that is counting the scintillations on a zinc sulfide screen so wherever alpha particles hit the zinc sulfide screen they get scintillations okay now they first studied small angle scattering small angle scattering means uh, if this is the incident beam okay if there is no scattering the beam goes like this okay now the deviations from the incident beam if this is the incident direction the deviation is the scattering angle so these are small angle scattering okay the, the, the scattering angle is of the order of 1 degree 2 degree up to let us say 10 degree hmm? um, so initially they studied this small angle scattering then they noted that a few alpha particles were scattered by large angles here these are large angle scatterings okay and a very few were even back scattered okay here the scattering angle is very high this is the incident beam okay uh, up to here let us say 90 degrees so this is close to 180 degree so if it just uh, comes back it's called 180 degree scattering or back scattering so they noted that very few alpha particles uh, very few were even back scattered okay uh, you can see uh, Rutherford's response uh, when uh, Geiger and Marsden reported this uh, uh, unusual case of large angle scattering. Okay, uh, he, this particular statement Rutherford made in 1936 in a lecture in 1936, uh, one year um, prior to his sudden demise. Uh, so he was um, remembering those incidents in 1909. So he was saying that, uh, that it was quite the most incredible event that has ever happened to me in my life. Okay, it was almost incredible as if you fired a 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper. Uh, a shell is like a cannonball. It's a cannonball. A 15 inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. Okay, so this backscattering was a a very incredible uh, measurement, a very incredible experimental discovery. So, in the next two years, in 1909 and 19, up from 1909 to 1911, Rutherford systematically tested each aspect of the scattering experiment. Okay, with the Geiger and Marsden. So, this team uh, redid all the uh, different aspects of the experiment. They redid all the measurements. Okay, checked all the measurements. And uh, Rutherford tried to explain the results using existing atom models, in particular Thomson's atom model. What if uh, Thomson's atom model was correct? Okay. Um, we know that in Thomson's atom model, uh, the positive charge of the nucleus is uniformly distributed over the sphere of the atom and electrons are randomly distributed or maybe revolving uh, in this positive sphere. Okay, now if the positive charge is uh, uniformly distributed over the atom, then when the alpha particles are coming, okay, alpha particles are ionized helium atoms, that means um, they have two units of positive charge plus 2e. So when they are coming, the <coughs> they, they will experience repulsion, okay. But this uh, force per unit area, okay the force of repulsion per unit area experienced by the alpha particles will be very small why because the positive charge of the atom is uniformly distributed over the atomic sphere so if the force per unit area is very small what happens most of the alpha particles will pass through the um, atom without any scattering and uh, some of the alpha particles may undergo uh, at most small angle scattering of the order of one degree two degree etc so if Thomson's atom model were correct, all the alpha particles should have, most of the alpha particles should have passed without any scattering and some should undergo a small angle scattering only. There should not be any large angle scattering or back scattering. So this uh, shows that the, the, the results, actual results of alpha particle scattering experiment shows that or show, it showed that Thomson's atom model was not correct. That was the conclusion obtained by Rutherford, um, Thomson Sound student. How did Rutherford explain the large angle scattering? Now, Rutherford found that the large deviation from the path of a massive charged particle like alpha particle. Remember, it's a, um, <clears throat> if it is a ionized helium atom, it has four atomic mass unit mass 
and uh, two plus two units of charge. Okay, so it is it, it has charge and it has uh, a heavy. Um, it's it's heavy. So such a particle, uh, in order to cause a large deviation from its path, then it can be explained only one way. Okay, most of the mass of the atom and most of its charge must be concentrated in a very small central region. Okay, in a very small central body, and uh, this central region was later called nucleus of the atom. So this idea of uh, nucleus that means the mass of the charge and uh, it's uh, most of the mass of the charge and its total positive charge must be concentrated instead of uniformly distributed as thomson uh, proposed um, it should be concentrated in a very small region at the at the center of the atom okay we call it nucleus so this idea um, rutherford obtained by analyzing the experiment um, the alpha particles the results of alpha particle scattering experiment rutherford derived a scattering formula okay this was the formula derived by rutherford uh, this n theta is the number of alpha particles per unit area reaching the screen at a scattering angle theta okay scattering angle means the angle between the incident beam the direction of the incident beam and uh, the direction of the scattered beam okay if scattering angle is theta then uh, number of alpha particles per unit area reaching the screen okay is equal to n i n t z square e raised to 4 divided by 8 pi epsilon 0 square r square kinetic energy square and sine raised to 4 theta by 2 n i is the total number of alpha particles incident on the target foil and uh, small n is the number of target atoms per unit volume in the foil t is the foil thickness and z is the atomic number of the foil atoms in, in, in the original alpha particle scattering experiment they used gold whose atomic number is 79 okay <clears throat> so that is that and r is the um, e is electronic charge of course and this is a constant we know r is the distance of the screen from the target foil okay the distance between the target foil and the sink sulfate screen and here the kinetic energy is half mv square the kinetic energy of alpha particle the initial kinetic energy of alpha particle theta is of course the scattering angle so uh, this formula um, the derivation is not part of our syllabus if uh, anybody wants to study the derivation you can refer the appendix by in in, in arthur baser okay it's a detailed derivation and um, even if you don't study the derivation you should be familiar with uh, some of the aspects of this uh, this formula it is directly proportional to the thickness um, of the foil so if foil thickness doubles um, the the number of particles uh, becomes uh, doubles okay number of scattered particles doubles in, in, along a particular scattering angle so it is proportional to foil thickness then proportional to square of the atomic number okay proportional to fourth power of electronic charge okay then inversely proportional to um, square of the kinetic energy or you can also say fourth power of velocity of the alpha particle okay kinetic energy is half mv square so fourth power of velocity is there and fourth power of sine of scattering angle okay these uh, parameters important uh, parameters on which this scattering um, number of scattered uh, particles alpha particles depends so rutherford uh, made this derivation um, in 1911 okay uh, in the previous slide also you must have noticed that uh, time uh, 19 uh, may 1911 uh, was the time uh, was, was the was the period at which uh, rutherford published his uh, paper um, explaining atomic structure with the, with the idea of a small central nucleus. Um, the, the, in the previous slide, I have given a hyperlink to the, there is a, a web resource uh, detailing the story behind the discovery of the atomic nucleus. Now, um, here is the experimental verification of Rutherford's uh, scattering formula. Uh, how the number of scattered particles depends on the scattering angle okay from the previous uh, slide you remember the scattering formula number of scattered particles is inversely proportional to fourth power of sine of theta by 2 right 
Um, so that dependence uh, when as theta increases the number of particles decreases okay um, you can see that um, see uh, the number of scattered particles is very high towards uh, small angles okay towards small angle uh, scattering that means most of the particles will undergo small angle scattering most of the particles are coming here uh, when you go to 180 degree backscattering, only very few particles uh, will undergo backscattering. So, that uh, trend in the scattering uh, is clearly reflected in this uh, formula. Okay. So, um, Rutherford scattering for not only this theta dependence, uh, the other uh, parameters like how it depends upon the, the, the foil thickness, then uh, how it depends upon... Um, yeah, um, the velocity of the, the, the incident velocity and the velocity of the kinetic or kinetic energy or velocity of the alpha particles and uh, how it depends upon the, the atomic number of the target atom. These different aspects were um, experimentally verified in the two year period uh, between 1911 and 1913 by Geiger and Marsden and in Rutherford's lab. So it was found that uh, this formula was essentially correct and it, it, it's, it very well matches with um, uh, experimental data. Okay. And uh, another important point is uh, the, the, this uh, formula, uh, Rutherford's formula breaks down at uh, backscattering at 180 degree. When backscattering happens, Rutherford scattering formula uh, fails. So during this period from 1911 onwards, once he derived this formula, Rutherford was systematically looking for um, uh, the, the, the scattering or by large angle scattering where his formula fails. Okay. So let us see what happens uh, uh, at the back scattering, uh, at the instant of the back scattering. Okay. What happens during back scattering? Um, See, I told you that at the time of backscattering, Rutherford scattering formula fails. Now, Rutherford estimated the size of the nucleus, okay, um, at the time of, uh, uh, by considering the situation at the time of backscattering. During uh, backscattering or 180 degree scattering, there is, there must be head-on collision between the incident alpha particle and the nucleus of the target atom okay uh, in the figure you can see that um, when the alpha particles are moving slightly away from the nucleus they may undergo they may pass without any scattering those coming near may undergo large angle scattering if there is a head-on collision there is almost a back scattering okay now when the alpha particle is far away from the target atom it has some kinetic energy let us call it kinetic energy alpha okay it is far away um, it's coming here. Since the distance is very large, let us say r tends to infinity, the electric potential energy of the system is zero, negligibly small or zero. So, what is the total kinetic energy, total energy of the system when the alpha particle is very far away? Only the kinetic energy of the alpha particle. Okay. So we have the target nucleus and uh, the alpha particle is coming. Alpha particle has plus two e charge target nucleus has some z e z times e charge both are positive charges so when the alpha particle comes nearer to the target nucleus and reaches a distance of closest approach okay minimum distance then its kinetic energy reduces to zero and then it is repelled back 180 degree scattering so um, we can say at the distance of closest approach let us use the symbol capital r for that the kinetic energy of the alpha particle is almost zero so what is the total energy? It should be equal to electric potential energy at R, at a separation R. What is this electric potential energy? 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0, Q1, Q2 by R. Now Q1 is charge of the alpha particle, which is plus 2E. Q2 is charge of the nucleus, which is Z times E, where Z is the atomic number, divided by R. R is the separation distance, okay? Distance of closest approach. Now, e, uh, when the alpha particle was very far away from the nucleus, what is the total what was the total energy of the system kinetic energy of alpha particle right and uh, when the alpha particle reaches the distance of closest approach kinetic energy reduces to zero but now there is a electric potential energy when it was very far away there was no electric potential energy because the distance was very large now equating the total energy at both positions total energy must be the same in, in both positions 
um, initial total energy which is kinetic energy of alpha particle equal to final total energy which is potential energy of the system. Now from we can rearrange that and obtain an expression for distance of closest approach 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 2 z e square by kinetic energy of alpha particle. Now this distance of closest approach is an approximate estimate of the size of the nucleus. Okay, um, it, it is not exact because alpha particle need not um, come up to the surface of the atomic nucleus. Okay, particularly when Rutherford was doing all these experiments, uh, only alpha particles from natural radioactive sources were available. There was no particle accelerator at that time. So uh, Rutherford could not accelerate charged particles. Therefore, um, from the natural sources, radioactive sources, um, the kinetic energy of alpha particle was of the order of 5 mega electron volt. Um, so at the 5 to 10 mega electron volt maybe. So uh, these alpha particles um, may not be able to, might not be able to um, reach the surface of the nucleus. So the distance of closest approach uh, by the best guess it should be uh, larger than the um, radius of the nucleus but uh, it gives you an upper limit of the size of the nucleus or radius of the nucleus. So that is the idea about the distance of closest approach. In 1919, okay, 1919, Rutherford was able to show a breakdown in his scattering formula for alpha particles of kinetic energy 7.7 .7 MeV scattered at uh, large angles for aluminum nuclei. Okay, whose uh, atomic number is uh, 30. So let us calculate the distance of closest approach with this data. Um, from the previous calculation, this is the expression 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0, 2 z e square by kinetic energy of alpha particle. Now in, in this um, expression, a particular combination e square by 4 pi epsilon 0, okay, this e square by 4 pi epsilon 0, uh, if you rearrange that uh, z is only a number, it has no unit. So therefore, if you keep e square by 4 pi epsilon 0 on one side and take this kinetic energy alpha to the left side. Uh, kinetic energy is energy which has the unit of joule. R is distance of closest approach which has the unit of meter. It means that e square by 4 pi epsilon 0 should, should have the unit of joule meter. Now if you convert this into electron volt meter, uh, remember we have done this type of a calculation in the case of HC h Planck's constant c uh, speed of light in vacuum hc is also a joule meter unit we have converted into electron volt meter electron volt nanometer actually 1240 electron volt nanometer um, we can also rearrange that in terms of um, mev fermi right in the same way this e square by 4 pi epsilon 0 if you calculate and i i suggest that you do this calculation yourself you, you know 1 by 4 pi epsilon 0 is uh, 9 into 10 raised to 9 and the e square value also you know um, that will give you joule meter in joule meter then you divide with the electronic charge okay then one electronic charge get cancelled so this calculation is very easy and what you get is a neat number 1.44 electron volt nanometer okay you know that this electron volt nanometer you can also rewrite as uh, mev femtometer so this is very useful e square by 4 pi epsilon 0 appears um, in many many um, formula in, in Particularly when, when we discuss Bohr model, you will see that this combination appears in many formula. It's a very important uh, constant. And uh, we will also see one more constant related to that uh, combination. Okay, anyway, this one, uh, remember this value and you do this calculation and verify that. So what I am going to do is here, um, instead of e square by 4 pi epsilon 0, I can substitute 1.44 and I am choosing this particular combination with this particular units, uh, MeV for me. Why? Because in the denominator you have kinetic energy of alpha particle which is 7.7 .7 MeV, right? Here. So MeV will cancel. That's why I'm doing that. And uh, 2 is, uh, yeah, it is the atomic number of alpha particle. Z is the atomic number of the target nucleus which is aluminum. If you do this calculation, you will get 4.86 femtometer. So this is the, um, this was the um, distance of closest approach Rutherford obtained in 1919 for aluminum um, nucleus. So it gives an upper limit at the best. It gives an upper limit of the radius of the aluminum nucleus and see the current estimate of the size of the aluminum nucleus is 3.6 femtometer. So it, it, this is a very good estimate in that sense. 
So in this way, distance of closest approach is a good estimate of the, um, particularly when the kinetic energy of the alpha particle is large. It's a good estimate of the size of the uh, nucleus. And um, uh, so size of the atom is of the order of 10 raised to minus 10 meter, one angstrom. And uh, size of the nucleus by 1919, Rutherford clearly established that size of the nucleus is of the order of 10 raised to minus 15 meter for uh, small nuclei like aluminum. Uh, when you go to larger nuclei, size increases. So it can go up to 10 raised to minus 14 meter. So generally it is of the order of 10 raised to minus 15 meter to 10 raised to minus 14 meter. So um, if you make a comparison between two, th these two, so we can see clearly that size of the atom is 10 raised to 5 times, right? Um, 10 raised to 5 means um, 1 lakh, 1 lakh times um, greater than size of the nucleus. So how do we make this, uh, um, we make a visualization or a feeling of this one? Um, because uh, 10 raised to minus 10, 10 raised to minus 15 are all the same for us because we don't have any feeling of um, such small magnitudes. So let us, uh, one way of um, making a, an experience of these numbers is, uh, you translate these numbers to our dimensions. Okay, let us say this uh, 10 raised to minus 15. Um, we, want, we want a comparison between 10 raised to minus 15 meter and 10 raised to minus 10 meter. Let us uh, uh, assume that uh, this 10 raised to minus 15 meter is equal to 1 centimeter. Okay, or 10 raised to minus 15 meter, we blow up into 1 centimeter. So let us assume that si suppose size of the nucleus is 1 centimeter. Then what will be the size of the atom? It should be 10 raised to 5 times uh, greater, right? So that means if nucleus is of the order of 1 centimeter, atom should be of the order of 10 raised to 5 centimeter. Okay, now what is this 10 raised to 5 centimeter? Let us convert it into meter. It is 10 raised to 3 meter. 10 raised to 3 meter means uh, 1000 meter. 1000 meter means 1 kilometer. Right? So if nucleus is uh, some entity with uh, a dimension of 1 centimeter, a radius of 1 centimeter, then the atom as a whole should be an entity with a radius of 1 kilometer. Um, for example, you imagine a very big stadium. Um, some uh, let us say uh, i think an olympic stadium the diameter of uh, it's not circular but still approximate diameter of an average and uh, radius of an olympic stadium uh, is uh, about 130 meter 130 meter radius uh, so you imagine an olympic stadium that's what i think you check uh, so um, you even consider an, uh, an olympic uh, stadium which is some 10 times um, higher than a typical Olympic stadium, a very big stadium, a stadium whose radius is of the order of one kilometer. If an atom is such a stadium, a nucleus is a small fly of dimension one centimeter at the center of that stadium. So that is the vast difference between size of an atom and size of the nucleus. And the, the, the rest of the atom is simply empty space. Okay, most of the atom is empty space. The entire, almost uh, the entire mass of the atom, except those of electrons, uh, and uh, the all the positive charge of the atom are concentrated at this very tiny central region. Okay, so the Rutherford was successful. He was the first person successful uh, in in estimating the the dimension of the nucleus also. With the information he gathered from um, alpha particle scattering experiment, Rutherford was able to propose um, his own atom model in 1911. What are the important features? We have already seen the different aspects. Let us um, consolidate them. Most of the mass of an atom and all of its uh, positive charge must be concentrated in a very small central region called the nucleus. Size of the nucleus is very, very small compared to the size of the atom. Total negative charge of the electrons is equal to the total positive charge of the nucleus so that the atom is electrically neutral. The electrons revolve around the nucleus as in a planetary model. Okay, So this is the central uh, region nucleus and the electrons are revolving around the nucleus in um, different uh, orbits. So this was uh, a, plan a sort of planetary model of the atom. Um, 
So this was the model proposed by Rutherford in 1911 and uh, by the time 1919 Rutherford um, also discovered proton okay that every nucleus must contain this entity a positive charged entity proton that also he discovered um, by the time 1919 now is this model stable the problem here is this according to classical electromagnetic theory any accelerating charged particle radiates energy this we have seen when we discussed the x-ray production okay about bremsstrahlung radiation Okay, here the Rutherford proposed that electrons are revolving around the nucleus. Then a revolving electron has a centripetal acceleration and hence it should radiate energy. If it radiates energy, its energy should decrease. Okay. Now um, look at this formula. We can actually uh, connect, um, write an expression for the total energy of um, such a Consider, for example, uh, Rutherford's atom model for hydrogen atom. Okay, so there is a plus E charge at the center. There is an electron with minus E charge revolving around the center nucleus. Then the total energy of the system, you can show that it is equal to minus uh, E square by 8 pi epsilon 0 into R, where R is the radius of the orbit. E is the energy. Now, then uh, you can re, uh, re I mean, uh, invert this formula and can and you can you will get r is equal to minus e square by 8 by epsilon 0 into e so what happens when um, energy e decreases okay when energy e decreases the radius uh, the expression for the radius becomes more and more negative that means the radius of the electron's orbit should decrease okay when energy decreases from this formula the, if the radius decreases, what will be the path of the electron? Okay, it should look like this. Let us see. So, if this is the nucleus, okay, and if the electron is revolving around the nucleus in a, in a circular orbit, then uh, as it revolves, it's a uh, it should radiate energy and its uh, energy should decrease right then its uh, radius also should decrease that means it should move in a spiral path in, in a continuously decreasing radius and uh, finally fall into the nucleus okay, this should be the path of the electron so when it finally falls into the nucleus what happens it destroys the atom okay so we know that this doesn't happen because we know that atom is stable and that's why we are here okay the entire universe is here it uh, accounts i mean it, uh, it's a an evidence direct evidence for the stability of the atom so somehow rutherford's model uh, could not explain the stability of the atom or we can see that it is in contradiction with the classical electromagnetic theory okay in terms of the stability of the atom so this was one problem with the uh, rutherford's atom model so we have seen that uh, Rutherford's model, uh, Rutherford's uh, alpha particle scattering experiment was a, was a very epoch-making experiment in physics. Um, in the sense that um, it, it was the first instance where high energy particles are smashed into um, target um, foils, target nuclei to study the structure of the atom. Okay. This was in 1909, okay, um, more than 100 years before, and even 100 years after, this is the major uh, way we study the structure of particles, structure of matter, even now. Okay, you have heard about uh, Large Hadron Collider in, in CERN, uh, in other particle accelerators. So, what we do essentially is we smash the particles together. Uh, so high energy particles are smashed together so we then uh, by analyzing the results we try to uh, infer information about data about uh, the structure of the um, if not structure of the atom or structure of the nucleus um, we study the structure of the nucleus we study the structure of fundamental particles nucleons okay and uh, other fundamental particles we 
discover new newer and newer particles so in that sense that uh, uh, alpha particle scattering experiment uh, designed by rutherford and uh, done by geiger and masden was really an epoch making uh, a new paradigm in experimental physics and this experiment uh, um, allowed rutherford to prove that thomson's atom model was not correct it also allowed him to discover the idea of atomic nucleus and uh, propose a new planetary model of the atom with uh, the the size of the nucleus very small compared to the entire size of the atom so in that sense rutherford model was a very very major step in physics but at the same time um, like any new theory it also opened many uh, raised many open questions okay these are uh, the major um, questions raised by the force model how do the electrons move around the nucleus to form a stable atom already we have seen that other force model uh, is in contradiction with um, classical electromagnetic theory in terms of the stability of the atom so how do the electrons move around the nucleus to form a stable atom how does their motion explain the observed spectral lines okay in the in the previous class uh, we have discussed the the long history of atomic spectra uh right from 1800 onwards um so the rich uh, history of uh, 100 year history of atomic spectra so how do how does their motion the motion of the electrons around the nucleus explain the observed spectral lines okay of different atoms uh if there are only z protons in the nucleus what causes the other half of the nuclear mass okay these these questions were raised in 1911 okay Uh, what force keeps the many protons confined to a very small region of size 10 raised to minus 14 meter you know protons have positive charge they they undergo electric repulsion so if they are tightly packed to a very small central region then there must be some cohesive force attractive force between them what is that force okay is it electromagnetic force or any some other force these were the questions raised uh, by rutherford satter model and uh, in the next class we will see the answer to the first two questions okay these two questions were answered by niels bohr okay so we will in the next class we will discuss bohr atom model of hydrogen thank you